This is a message that the Lord laid on my heart to share with the body of Christ. And the title of it is A Call to Repentance, Part 1. The subtitle would be A Message to the Church or A Message to the Body of Christ. If you have your Bibles, join me in the book of Joel, chapter 1, and we will be reading from verses 1 through 12. The word of the Lord reads, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine. Because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Lament like a vir virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers, for what the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. When the prophet Joel, whose name in itself means the Lord is God, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, spoke these words to the people of God. Now, although we don't know very much about the prophet Joel himself, and there's no explicit indication of exactly when this particular book of the Bible was written, however, what we do know is that this prophet was greatly used by God and spoke as a mouthpiece of God in a time of national crisis and at a time when people really needed to hear the true word of the Lord. Because as it is now, so it was then. People have not changed. Whenever a national crisis occurs, many come on the scene with their opinions. They come on the scene with their interpretations of events. They come on the scene with their responses and with their answers. However, God wanted the people to know what was on his mind. So he raises up and sends forth his mouthpiece, the prophet Joel to override and overrule the voices, to override and overrule the public opinions and interpretations, and to speak forth the unadulterated word of God so the people of God can be very clear in their understanding and interpretation of the current event at that time. Again, God wanted the people to know what was on his mind, and he used the prophet Joel to carry his words. So in this particular passage of scripture we just read, if you look at verse two, the prophet asked two questions. The first thing or question that he asked is this, has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Now for understanding in context, the prophet is referencing a recent swarm of locusts that had come upon the land bringing great destruction and great devastation upon the land. This plague of locusts was sent by God as judgment upon the people for their sin and for their idolatry. Therefore, this is the source of reference for this particular question. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? 
A swarm of locusts is known as the most destructive migratory pest in the world. A swarm of locusts moving through a country is one of the most devastating occurrences that can transpire in an agricultural society because food and income are impacted. So whenever and wherever locusts arrive, they are very well known to strip fields, they damage trees, crops, they eat the leaves, the fruit, the seeds, the stems, the vines, the bark, and then the growing vegetation on the veg in the growing vegetation. It has been said that they are able to eat their body weight in food in a day. And they breathe very quickly, very, very quickly. They literally can swarm by the billions and can travel approximately 90 miles per day. In history, they're known as the countless. That's one of the names that was given to them. In history, they are also known as the darkness of the sun, so to speak, because a swarm of locusts can be so densely populated, it can literally block the sun just as a group of thick clouds can block the sun on any given day. And because of their weight, they've been known to topple trees when they settle in masses. So in general, they're known as one of the most destructive forces of nature because they not only harm the present vegetation, but future produce as well, due to the severe damage upon the trees and vegetation that they often leave behind. They can swarm, they can live, they can linger for months. So this is not just a one day occurrence, so to speak, when they arrive. In the book of Joel, chapter two, verse three, this is what scripture says concerning the locusts. It says, the land is like the garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. A swarm of locusts is literally unstoppable. No walls can stop them, no ditches, fires put in their path, and to some extent, even pesticides can't do but so much. They, they, they just seem to keep coming forward like a well-trained, well-disciplined army. So in this case, the damage was so severe that it affected the nation at that time. None were exempt. Every sector, every segment, and every vein of their society was affected or hindered by this plague. The economy of the nation was devastated. Food, income, social life impacted. People were distraught because the routine of their everyday life was disrupted, so to speak, and suddenly they found themselves in this new normal that they had to deal with, that they had to adjust to, that they had to cope with, so to speak. So it was a very, very difficult time that had come upon them unawares. But please let me be clear, because this event in the book of Joel was not instituted or engineered by Satan or the devil, so to speak. This event was not engineered by Mother Nature. This was not climate change or some random, unnatural, natural disaster. This was not a conspiracy formulated in the hearts of men and implemented. God himself sent this and God was coming for his people through this national crisis. God was calling his people to repentance. Listen well. Now, although this judgment was severe at that time, it really wasn't sent by the Lord to completely destroy the people of God. But it was sent by God to get their attention. Yes, this was what we can call a, a major, major attention getter at that time. Now, the question can be asked, why did God use locusts for his intent and purposes then? If you look in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, this is the chapter that God promised blessings to his people for obedience and curses for disobedience. So in this particular chapter, one of the judgments for disobedience that he pronounced was locusts. In Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse, verse 38, it reads, it says, you should carry much seed out to the field and gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. 
Deuteronomy 28 and 42, it reads, and also locusts shall consume all your trees and produce of your land. So God warned them that he would judge them for their disobedience. However, in the midst of the devastation, divine instruction from the Lord begins to take shape and form and come forth through the prophet Joel. So in verse 13 through 16, scripture reads, it says, gird yourself and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. It said, consecrate a fast. Call an assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Is not the fool cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of God. Now, this is what you have to understand about the God that we serve. See, whenever the people of God would deviate, whenever they would fall into sin, and idolatry. Whenever they would go their own way, whenever they would go too far, God would raise up a prophet to preach repentance and an unquestionable, undeniable, thus saith the Lord would come forth that would cause a chill in the hearts of the people. In those hearts who were still tender and pliable because they knew and understand that their life, their future, depended upon their response to the word of the Lord. Now, maybe they did not like the prophet. Maybe they did not even like the word, but in their heart of hearts, they knew God was speaking. They knew God was calling them to repentance. They understood God was giving them a remedy, throwing them a lifeline through repentance. So in chapter two, verses 12 through 17, the word of the Lord reads, it says, now, Therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering, a drink offering, for the Lord your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregations. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O God, and do not give your heritage to reproach. That, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Now, the God that we serve, the God of the Bible, he's a promise keeper. He does not waste words. So God sent a swarm of locusts upon the land in judgment, just as he promised that he would. So the nation was devastated. The economy was devastated. Their social life disrupted. Life has suddenly, very suddenly changed. The providential hand of the Lord was heavy upon the nation, and there was a call of repentance that came straight from the loving heart of God, along with specific instructions as how their repentance should be carried out. So again, this was divine judgment. This was their personal attention getter. And he was calling his people to repentance to repent and put back in place those things which were misaligned. Misaligned with his will, misaligned with his intentions and purposes. He wanted to bring divine order back to the people of God and back to the house of God. So in addition, he was also warning them concerning the future day and time period of divine judgment and destruction coming known as the day of the Lord. And if you continue reading in the book of Joel, after the call to repentance in chapter two, 
God then begins to promise a time of refreshing the land. He speaks of restoration. He speaks of a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. However, repentance was the stipulation. These promises were contingent upon. See, I don't believe it's a coincidence that the prophet's Joel name means the Lord is God. Because through this swarm of locusts, I believe God was making a very strong statement to his people that the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Now fast forward to 2020, approximately March slash April in these United States of America. The country that we live in is facing this unprecedented national crisis. And even though we don't have a plague of locusts here in the U.S. today like they have in Africa, we are facing COVID-19 along with many other things that are happening. And God is trying. He's trying to get our attention today just as he was trying to get their attention then. And as I stated earlier, whenever there is a time of national crisis, many come on the scene with their opinions. Many come on the scene with their interpretations of events, their answers, their, their responses. And very few of them represent God's opinion. God's interpretation of events, God's response, and God's remedy to the situation. So let me, let me be very blunt and, and, and very clear. See, first, this COVID-19 is the judgment of God upon this wayward, rebellious, self-serving, self-seeking, lukewarm, idolatrous, irreverent, worldly 21st century church. And I state it first because scripture tells us that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Secondly, this COVID-19 is also judgment upon an arrogant, ungodly, evil, greedy, narcissistic, self-serving, and self-seeking world. And just as God was beckoning for their attention in the book of Joel by sending the plague of locusts in yesteryear, Today, he is beckoning for our attention today by sending this virus. This virus has literally devastated this country and the world in a very short period of time. And just as with the locusts in the passage of scripture we just read, God is raising up a true prophetic voice. He's raising up true prophetic voices to override and overrule all the other voices the voices of an undiscerning church leadership, the voices of the media, the voices of public opinions and interpretations. So the people of God, once again, can be very clear in their understanding, very clear in their interpretation of the current event. So they can be clear concerning what is on the mind of God himself, that they can be clear concerning God's intention and his remedy concerning this current event. You see, I don't care what anybody says, COVID-19 is not sent from the devil. This is not mother nature. This is not climate change. This is not some freak of nature. This COVID-19 is not a conspiracy birthed in the heart of man and implemented. This is the hand of judgment of a holy God upon the wayward, spiritually adulterous church and the sinful, ungodly, arrogant, narcissistic, and stubborn world. This is our modern day attention getter from the providential and divine hand of God because just like then, things have gone too far and God is coming for his people. God has pushed the pause and reset button at the same time. And is making a statement just as he did then in yesterday, yesteryear that the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is God. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 19, it's a very similar passage of scripture to Deuteronomy 28, where God begins to tell his people, of the blessings they will receive for their obedience and for the curses that they will receive for their disobedience. Now, God was speaking directly to them 
of yesteryear. But scripture tells us that the New Testament was given for our example. And in verse 26, or chapter 26 and verse 19 of Leviticus, God makes a profound statement. He says, I will break the pride of your power. That's what he told the people. I will break the pride of your power. And what he was saying, because that word power basically means the pride of your material, your physical, your personal, your social, and your political might, strength, and confidence. In other words, God was saying, all these things that you worship, all these things that you put your faith in, all these things that you put your confidence in, that you look to for your sustenance, God said, I will break the pride of your power. And evidence very strongly suggests that God has done just as he promised once again. He's broken the pride of our power. In just a short period of time, this COVID-19 has severely affected every sector, every segment, every vein of our society. None are exempt. The economy is devastated. Incomes are impacted. Food and supply chains have been impacted. Personal and social life has been impacted. People are distraught because the routine of everyday life has been hindered or delayed. There's this new normal, so to speak, we now have to cope with and adjust to. A national state of emergency has been declared by the president for all 50 states. Statewide emergency has been declared by our governors. Wall Street and the stock market has been greatly impacted. There's instability in our financial institutions. Public and private transportation have been impacted. Foreign and domestic travel impacted. Large corporations, small companies, private companies adversely impacted. Professional associations, conferences have been canceled. Schools from kindergarten to universities are closed. All forms of recreation and group hobbies, group competitions, impacted, delayed. Professional sports, the, one of the biggest idols in this country, have been suspended or altered. The NBA, the NHL, the MLB, soccer leagues all over the world. The famous March Madness NCAA tournament was canceled. All the workers, vendors who make a living around college and professional sports impacted. Vacations, tourist attractions all over this country, planned trips, cruises, all forms of leisure impacted. The entertainment industry, concert halls, museums, Broadway, whoever thought Hollywood would be impacted by anything, all impacted. Disney World is closed. God has shut down the malls. Universal Studios is closed. Millions of jobs lost, furloughed. In some places, food and supplies impacted. Shelves at grocery stores, some of them are empty. Toilet paper is now a commodity. Local farmers market impacted. Local restaurants, food halls, catering services impacted. Churches are literally closed. Any large gatherings discouraged. Daily life as we have known it has either been altered, changed, delayed, or completely shut down. Social distancing has become the most popular practice. Now in the beginning of the passage of scripture I read to you from the book of Joel in yesteryear, God asked this question through the prophet. He said, has anything like this happened in your days. And if you listen today to our neighbors, our coworkers, and as we meet people out in the public continually, I'm hearing people say, I have never seen anything like this before. Never seen anything like this before. And prophetically speaking, in the spirit, I hear another question that's coming forth from the heart of God on this day. And I really believe that the spirit of the Lord is asking the church on this day, at this hour, at this moment, I believe he's asking, do I have your attention now? 
Do I have your attention now? The spirit of the Lord said, I have shut it all down. All your idols, all of the things that took my place in your heart, all of that which made you self-sufficient, kept you occupied, too busy to spend time with me. All of which you gave your attention to, your affection to, rather than me, I shut it all down. God is saying, do I have your attention now? God is letting us know just as he did in yesteryear, that the Lord is God. And like the locust of yesteryear in the book of Joel, this COVID-19 is our modern day attention getter that is coming straight from the providential hand of God. Think about it. Only the hand of God could reach this far and this deep. Only the hand of God could get the attention of every nation, every person in the world like he has at this time on this day. Through this COVID-19, there's this call that's coming from his heart. And it's a call for the church to repent. And like the children of Issachar, we must have an understanding of the times so we can know what to do. Most definitely, life has changed. And we may not get back to what we used to consider normal life, so to speak. That there's been this shift but in the midst of the shift, in the midst of the virus, God is saying repent. He's calling for repentance. He's calling for divine order to be restored among the people of God and in the house of God. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. See, we need to see God in all of this. Again, this is not climate change. Don't listen to the lies. This is not a conspiracy, but God, we need to see him in all of this. And we need to hear his voice. We need to receive his instructions, his remedy moving forward. When COVID-19 began, when it first began to spread, immediately a popular teacher, very popular teacher in the body of Christ, put a video out on YouTube titled, Seven things God wants you to know during this virus attack. Seven things God wants you to know during this virus attack. And the first thing he listed was don't be afraid. Second thing was refresh yourself with his love. Number three, trust in his faithfulness. Number four, be at rest. Five, be led by the spirit. Six, keep your focus on Jesus. And number seven was death has no hold on you. Now, what is missing from this list of encouragements? What, what is the pink elephant in the church that is not on this list? Repentance. Not even mentioned. See, this is very typical in the body of Christ today. It has been said that we like to call the nation to repentance. But at what point do we call the church to repentance? You see, there's this, this very strong arrogance that dwells in the body of Christ that is so strong that even in these circumstances, even in these conditions, repentance is not even considered. Never considered. That just maybe, just maybe, God does not like the direction of the church, doesn't like the direction that the church is headed, and he's trying to get our attention so that we can repent and turn. Just maybe, I mean, totally tone deaf to even the possibility that God is calling his church to repentance at this time. Lord, help us. So when this virus hit, a multitude of pastors, leaders, totally skipped repentance and went straight to Psalm 91 mode. And what they did was they shifted the sins of the church under the shadow of the Almighty, so to speak. And I can tell you with a certainty, although these seven encouragements that I read above sound appropriate, they are not what God is saying to the church at this hour. These seven are not what God is communicating through this pandemic. God gave me another list of seven that he's communicating. And he wanted me to share them with you because your future depends upon having an understanding of all seven of these items. 
Number one is repent. Number two is repent. Number three is repent. Number four, repent. Five, repent. Six, repent. Number seven, God is saying repent. Can I tell you repentance is seemingly a lost word in the church along with sin, along with holiness, consecration, and reverence. So let me clarify or, or give the definition of what repentance really means because we're living at a time, sad to say, that many in the body don't even know what repentance means. Biblical repentance doesn't mean just to be sorry, sorry for your sins, so to speak. It, it, it doesn't stop there. It continues with a change in your mind, which in turn will cause a change in your action. Repentance is not apologizing. It's not confessing or being sorry for getting caught. Repentance is not just some emotional decision. Biblical repentance includes this concrete intellectual decision to turn and take a new direction in life, a direction away from self, a direction away from sin and your old way of thinking, your old way of living and turning towards the Lord, turning towards his will, his way, moving in his direction, embracing a godly way of thinking, a godly way of living, a new direction in life. It's a complete 180 degree turn in one's thinking and one's behavior. It's rare, but whenever the word repentance is mentioned in the church today, many honestly feel there's not much, if anything at all, to repent of. I mean, we have done it our way so long that the thought of God calling us to repentance is foreign. We never even pause to think whether or not the God we serve may be pleased with what we're doing, the direction that we're heading. And I can tell you of a truth, there's so much that God is not pleased with in the body of Christ, in the church. There's so much that we need to repent of. And with that understanding, that understanding, forthcoming is a list of items the church need to repent of. And if you listen at this list, you will know it has these five reoccurring things, five reoccurring things that God is calling the church to repent of. Sin in general, but also lukewarmness, irreverence, idolatry, and worldliness. Repentance has got to start with the leadership in the body of Christ. Pastors, elders, bishops, leaders in the house of God, it's got to start with us. You see, this happened on our watch. It happened on our watch. God has placed us as watchmen on the wall, but we fail in many respects. And repentance is appropriate and overdue for the leadership in the body of Christ. We need to repent for not spending enough time in the word and prayer outside of studying for a sermon. We need to repent for not consistently modeling and leading the people of God in fasting, prayer, and intercession, and for abandoning or giving very little time to the prayer meeting. We need to repent for allowing the people of God to worship us and steal the glory of God. Yeah, it feels good, but we're still in the glory of God. We need to repent for losing the fear of the Lord by cherry picking his word rather than preaching the full counsel of the word of God, exalting denominational beliefs over biblical doctrine. We need to repent for being obsessed with money, for fleecing and manipulating the flock, for being spiritual cowards, for watering down the gospel and refusing to preach against sin. As a matter of fact, in some cases, even refusing to say the word sin. We need to repent for removing words such as holiness, consecration, hell, and judgment from our vocabulary and from our sermons. God is saying repent. We need to repent for allowing political correctness to censor 
our preaching. And for the sake of tolerance and inclusivism, preaching this perverted definition of the love of God. We need to repent for allowing ministry to become our mysteries and building our own kingdoms rather than building the kingdom of God. We need to repent, leaders, for not being the watchmen on the wall that God has called us to be. God trusted us. He gave us a responsibility, but we haven't been discerning. We haven't discerned the holy from the unholy, the sacred from the profane. And as a result, we have allowed the church to be infiltrated, penetrated, and saturated with the culture and the world. We need to repent for binding the hands of the Holy Spirit, rejecting or disavowing his spiritual gifts to his body, for unscripturally claiming that the gifts have ceased to be in operation, that they no longer exist in this dispensation. However, contrarily, in other circles, repentance is called for as well because in other circles, we've exalted the spiritual gifts especially the prophetic, above the word of God itself. We've gone way beyond moderation. It's all about the prophetic in many places. We need to repent for calling ourselves CEOs, life coaches, and for duplicating and copying the manners, ways, structures of corporate America, and for governing our churches as if they were corporations. We need to repent, leaders, for following trends and allowing the church to be driven and influenced by statistics, by surveys, market strategies, techniques, rather than being led by the Holy Spirit of God. We need to repent for being more concerned about being relevant to an unholy, ungodly culture than we are concerning pleasing God. We need to repent, leaders, for marginalizing other members of the body and allowing passive racism to exist in our hearts and in our ministry. We need to repent for being content to be surrounded with those who look like us and not actively working towards the oneness in the body Jesus prayed that we would have. We need to repent for being fearful, scared to exercise church discipline and being more concerned with numbers, with tithes, with offerings, than we are concerned about order, discipline, and accountability in the house of God. We need to repent for sticking so strictly to a program or agenda that we don't give place for the Holy Spirit to move and work in the midst of corporate worship. We need to repent for shifting worship from being God-centered to man-centered, and not depending on the Holy Spirit, but depending on worldly and secular methods to attract crowds, such as worldly music, marketing techniques, coffee and donut shops, bookstores, flashy, sensual staging and lighting in the house of God that really sets the stage for entertainment rather than worship. Let me just detour here for a moment because I, I, I got to get this one in. I was attending a church or I visited a church for a business purpose, very nice church. And I got a chance to speak with one of the workers there. And he began to tell me just how the church was growing. Church was growing very rapidly. So, you know, I got curious. So I began to question him. I said, well, you know, why is the church growing? Are you guys doing evangelism? Is it the messages that the passage that the pastor uh, you know, are preaching. And he said, no, he said, this is what he told me. He said, we're, he said, we're just so laid back here. He said, we come in dressed as we are. We get some coffee, we get some donuts. We go into the sanctuary. He said, we're, we're just so laid back here. Can I tell you on the inside of me, something was swelling up. What, why is it? Why is it church? that we can bring intensity and passion to everything else except the house of God. We bring intensity and passion to our relationships, to all forms of social media. We bring 
intensity and passion to our jobs and careers. We bring intensity and passion to our favorite athlete, sports teams, not to mention political affiliations. Why is it that when it comes to the house of God, we are just so laid back? Let me tell you, the presence of God will not dwell where there is disorder and irreverence. You may have a group of people gathered. You may be doing a whole lot of different things, but where there is disorder and irreverence, the presence of God, presence of God is not there. When we come together as a body, we're not a social club. It's not an event. It's not a place and time to come in and do you, so to speak. There's a certain amount of order and reverence that we should bring to the house of God. The Lord is saying, repent, bring back order so that my presence can dwell with my people. Continuing on the list, leaders, bishops, pastors, we need to repent for giving in to the pressure of those who whine and complain about church service being too long, for advertising these quick one-hour church services. In other words, we'll keep it short so you won't have to be bothered with God for long and you can move along in your day doing the things that you really want to do. You know, so you can just go ahead and get church out of the way, so to speak. We need to repent for allowing the wisdom of the church, God help us, the elderly, the gray hair, to be cast aside in exchange for the young, gifted, talented, but inexperienced. We need to repent for allowing our denominations to split over issues the word of God clearly states are sin, such as homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and the entire LGBTQ agenda. God is saying repent. Pastors, bishops, leaders, we need to repent. And we need to move away from the wisdom of man, away from following trends, away from self-serving agendas. And as under shepherds, and that's all we are, just under shepherds. I don't care what title you have, you're just an under shepherd. We need to seek the face of God as never before so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit so that we can lead God's people, God's way. For these things, leaders, God is calling us to repent. And for the body of Christ at large, let me just say this to the church. Church, the, the Lord is holy. God is holy. He's separate from anyone and anything else. He's distinct from anyone or anything that has ever existed or ever will come into existence. In addition, he's morally pure. He's holy. He, he's perfect in all his ways. He's set apart. He's different. He's in the class of his own. He's not common or ordinary in any way. See, God is not the big guy or the man in the sky. He's not the man upstairs. God is not your homie, nor is he your boyfriend. He's God. He's holy and he's calling the body of Christ to repentance because too often we have not approached him with the awe, with the reverence, with the honor, with the respect that he deserves. Too often we've overemphasized his goodness and grace at the expense of neglecting the fear and the reverence of the Lord. In short, we have become too familiar we have marginalized and downgraded his holiness, his majesty, and he's calling the body of Christ to repent. See, we need to repent, church, because we have not set ourselves apart as the called out ones, but we've imitated the culture and the world in just about every aspect. Worship leaders, worship leaders, hear me well. Many of our worship songs now in the house of the Lord the music is saturated with the spirit of the world. The lyrics are so full of pronouns, you don't know who is being sung to. This 21st century church bashes hymns. However, at the same time, much of the music that's coming forth is very worldly, and it goes straight to the flesh, not an ounce of a Norton on it. And on top of that, it's a little scary because it borders on romantic. 
Some of the music, music even borders on erotic. It's like, who in the world are you singing to? Are you singing to a holy God or are you singing to your husband, your wife, or your boo? God is saying, repent. Worship leaders, we need to repent because many of you are just too sexy in front of the people of God. We see too much of you and not enough of God. The Lord is saying, repent, cover up the body parts, back off the overly tight clothing and bring modesty back into my house, says the Lord. Shift the attention away from yourself as you lead, as you lead his people, his people in worship to him. Worship leaders, many need to repent because you're seeking fame and notoriety just as the world seeks fame and notoriety. And in the process, you have sold out to the culture, you sold out to the world. You have marketed, merchandised, and sold your gifts as if they were your own and not for the body of Christ with an attitude that says, if you don't pay, then I don't play or sing. God help us. Let me ask you this. What do you have? What gifting do you have that God did not give you? And he gave it to you for the body. He gave it to you for the local church, but some of y'all are too big for the local church. God is saying, get back in place, get taught the word of God and share your gift with my local people. We need to repent for not being discerning and bringing or allowing worldly activities into our sanctuaries and calling it worship. We bring any and everything into the house of God, try to put Jesus in front of it and call it worship. Jeroboam did that and he made a grave mistake. And just like the sin of Jeroboam, we have allowed unauthorized worship in the house of God. We need to repent for these self-proclaimed Christian comedians that irreverently make fun of God and the things of God. Now, I'm not saying we can't laugh, but there's a line that we can't cross because God is holy. And the Great Commission tells us this. It says, go ye and preach the gospel. It didn't say go ye and make fun and mockery of the holy things of God. God forgive us. He's calling us to repent. He's calling us to repent because we have allowed the devil himself to walk into our sanctuaries. Go to the light switches, turn off or heavily dim all the lights in the sanctuary and model our churches after nightclubs. God help us. Sometimes when you see some of these churches, you don't know what it is. A concert, a rock concert, a secular uh, event, you don't know what it is. All the sensual lighting, all the staging, and under the disguise of creating this, quote, atmosphere for worship. Can I tell you, God is a God of light. And in him is no darkness at all. God is saying, cut the lights back on in my house and worship me because I'm holy. You can't worship me like you worship your entertainers, like you worship your singers, your secular singers. We need to repent for imitating the entertainment and activities of the world. Again, for bringing in it and everything in the sanctuary and professing it to be worship. Church, we have allowed music and the spirit of entertainment to completely take precedence over the word of God. Can I tell you, as much as we love the music, it can never take place of the word of God. We need to repent and put the word of God back in its rightful place. We need to repent and put music back in its rightful place. Some of us spend more time, way, way more time with music than we do with the word of God itself. It's become an idol. God is saying repent. Put it back in its proper order. We need to repent for being infatuated with these, quote, so-called Christian celebrities and celebrity bishops, celebrity pastors, celebrity worship leaders, just celebrity. 
And we need to repent for coveting the worldly fame that they glory in, that they take pride in. We need to ask God to forgive us for chasing the deceitfulness of riches just like the world does, for not trusting him, for forgetting that we are his special people set apart for his use. We need to repent for hijacking spiritual gifts. You know, scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit distributes gifts, spiritual gifts, as he wills. However, this 21st century church, many claim spiritual giftings that the Holy Spirit never sent their way. Claiming gifts the Holy Spirit never gave them. Can I tell you, this will cause the body of Christ, and it has called the body of Christ to be misaligned, to be out of order. Woman of God, I love you, but God's order is not for you to have spiritual authority over a man. He has many wonderful gifts and talents for you, but having spiritual authority over men is not one of them. And if you love Jesus as much as you say you do, then why misalign his body? Why cause his body to be out of order due to selfish ambition? God is saying, repent. We have forgotten the cross. We have forgotten the blood of Jesus. We have forgotten denying self, following him. We need to repent for loving the world more than we love God, for allowing the pride and busyness of life to keep us away from the foot of the cross. For allowing so much of the world to take first place in our hearts, we need to repent for taking in hours upon hours of sex, violence, and shenanigans and calling it entertainment. Then coming into the sanctuary and lifting up holy hands. We need to repent for cheering louder for our favorite athlete, entertainer, than we do for God when we worship in him. We need to repent for our addiction to social media, for spending more time with our virtual friends than we do the word of God, for investing more of ourselves in social media than we invest in the word of God, in prayer, in intersection. We need to repent for texting, doing corporate worship, for emailing, posting as the man of God is preaching. We need to repent for cuddling our cell phones more than we cuddle the Bible. Parents, Christian parents, the Lord is saying repent for allowing social media, the television, the iPads, the cell phone to raise our children and grandchildren and delegating their spiritual development to the church. We need to repent. We need to repent for allowing political correctness to exist in the house of God. For majoring in politics, social justice, rather than salvation and the service and the work of the Lord. The body of Christ, we have not discerned the holy from the unholy, the sacred from the profane. We have allowed much sin and ungodliness to coexist and even to operate within the confines of the body of Christ. We have allowed secret orders, secret societies such as the Masonic Lodge, sororities, fraternities, and other exclusive and esoteric organizations to exist within the confines of the local church. God is saying, get it out of my house. It's not of me. It's unholy. We need to repent. Pastors, bishops, leaders, if you're in secret orders, secret societies, esoteric organizations, God is saying, repent, let it go. You can't hold on to it and hold on to him at the same time. It's unholy. It's not of God. God is saying, repent. Church, we have offered main and defective offerings to the Lord by being slothful by being lukewarm, by being half-baked with our service and work of the Lord, by giving more diligence to everything else, but making the service and the work of the Lord an option. God is saying repent. 
we left our first love. Our hearts have grown cold towards the word and towards the judgments of God. We've become desensitized. We've gotten too busy neglecting the prayer and the word. We, we've harbored secret sins, pet sins in our heart. God help us. He's saying repent. We've depended upon and trusted in and invested more in our political leaders and affiliation than in the Lord. We have expected God to be our servant rather than bound the knee to his service. For so many of us, all we want God to do is to take care of our enemies, heal our boo-boos, provide for us, give us the desires of our heart. We want him to protect us from our enemies, to protect our loved ones. And then after he does all of that, we tend to want him to leave us alone so we can live life the way we desire. God is saying repent. He's calling for a close, intimate relationship with his people. We have not prayed for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the globe as we should have prayed. And we have not wept for the lost, the dying, the unsaved as we should. Forgive us, O oh Lord. This list is not exhausted. Just some things God laid on my heart to share. And I really believe with this COVID-19 that God has hit the pause and reset button at the same time because he desires to bring back divine order to his people, to the sanctuary of God. Thing has just gone too far. Things have gotten just too out of hand. This COVID-19, this is our modern day attention getter and was sent by God to cause us to truly repent, to truly change and be the church and do church, not our way, but God's way. So my prayer personally is that this event, this COVID-19, this, this attention getter by God will accomplish in all of our hearts, the hearts of the leader, leaders of the church, the hearts of the body, that it will accomplish what God intends and that is for the pride of our power to be broken. That is for the eyes of our understanding to be open to the degree that it will cause the church to turn. Turn away from sin. Turn away from irreverence. Turn away from idolatry. Turn away from lukewarmness and, and worldliness. And, and turn back to God. Turn back to his way. To his will being done in our lives. Individually and corporately because if we repent after the repentance will come a time of refreshing a time of restoration a time of the outpouring of the spirit of the lord again this is not the end god has graciously given us a space of time to repent to arise and to be the church that he's called us to be yes life may have changed, but this is not the end. And we must seek ye the Lord while there's still time. We must call upon him while he is near. And the church must arise. We must come on the scene. The world is doing the best that it can right now to keep things together. But it's, it's only human effort. It's only the wisdom of man. The world needs the church to come on the scene and be the church. I said earlier that Joel means the Lord is God. And I believe as it was then, so it is now. God was making a statement then. And I think he's making a very strong statement now to his people that the Lord is God. So to the church, and this message is strictly for the church. I leave you with the words and instructions of the prophet Joel. He says, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. 
Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he would turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Consecrate a fast, the word tells us in the book of Joel. He said, call the sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, the nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. I'm telling you, church, God is calling us to repent, repentance. Don't miss it. We got to lay before the Lord. And we got to ask God to forgive our sin. We have to ask God to heal this land. Because we got to be the church. For those under the sound of my voice whose hearts are not yet callous and have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, Please hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church as a whole today. He's calling us to repentance at this time. God bless you all. May the Lord be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.